Good afternoon or good morning from you, right, Cheryl? Yes, good morning, but good afternoon to you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This is, uh, I'm very excited because we are basically connecting the ponds uh, today. Um, I'm here together with uh, Cheryl Zimmerman and uh, from Far Sounder, and we're going to do a really good topic. Um, and everybody who's in uh, tuned in, thank you so much. Please feel free to share where you're based at the moment. It was always nice to see everybody. I'm in Palma. Where are you, Cheryl? I'm in Rhode Island in the U.S., about 20 minutes from Newport. Great. So um, beautiful environment, people tell me, by the way. I've, I've, I've never been, but like... Uh, it's, oh, it's, it's wonderful. Fun. We have Narragansett Bay, which is a really big sailing capital, like, like Palma. And uh, it's also our laboratory where we do all our experiments. And it's got great, great wow. interesting bottoms and all, um, sea wrecks, all sorts of things. Okay, I, ho I hope to visit. I hope to visit. Let's hope that they lift the travel ban so we can visit see each other again yeah. in person. So, um, what are we doing today? Obviously, we're doing a webinar, and uh, we're doing this webinar together with uh, the CEO of Far Sounder. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, and I'm pretty sure that Cheryl will tell more about herself later. And uh, yeah. so, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm here together with Joanna, and we're talking today about how to safely go off a beaten path and um, the difference between two and three 3D sonars, uh, the use of forward-looking sonar, and um, the tips on how to get where and where you want to go to. Um, I've already had a quick peek at the presentation, and there's some great examples towards the end of things that didn't completely go the way it should go. Yeah? And uh, But without much further ado, uh, shall, uh, shall I start your presentation and give the floor to you? Yes, perfectly. Yep. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I'll be watching the chat, ladies and gentlemen. So please ask your questions and uh, engage with us. And uh, I'll be popping back uh, whenever is required. All yours, Cheryl. Yep, perfect. Thank you, Ono, for the kind introduction. This morning or this afternoon, wherever you are, we're going to speak about how to safely go off the beaten track and using forward-looking sonar to make sure that you are safe. And okay. Uh, my name is Cheryl Zimmerman. I'm the CEO of Far Sounder. Uh, I've been in the marine industry almost 20 years. Um, my background's mechanical engineering, but for Far Sounder, I've been leading the push from the original when it was in a laboratory to commercialize products and now to our global presence, uh, which is quite strong. We are located in, New um, in Warwick, Rhode Island, not too far from Newport for you sailors out there. And uh, the bay is our, our laboratory. And I'll show you different things that we do as we go through our topic points. But at first, I'd like to give you a small overview of forward-looking sonars, just so you, for those of you who don't have a background and may not know about them, but then we'll get more into how it operates on your super yacht and what the displays, what types of capabilities uh, you can see in the, the different screens. And the second half, we'll talk more about uh, how to get safely where you are going to, and um, and we'll talk about some of the, the accidents uh, along the way um, that, that people have had and um, how to minimize that using forward-looking sonar. Compared to other marine electronics, um, forward-looking sonar uh, is, is a much younger technology and it's an ex a very expanding field of technology. We're, we're very excited. My R&D team works very hard at utilizing the latest state-of-the-art um, uh, techniques um, in order to incorporate them into our sonars. And um, those of you who know Far Sounder and our 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 ghost navigation systems um, um, may already have have been using it, um, but uh, other of you may not be familiar. So so we will start at a, a more simplified area, we'll help you explore the world. On a beautiful yacht like this one, 
you would never think of not having a radar, having ECTIS, having your or your electronic charts and GPS and, and different types of systems to help you as you explore the world. Um, and but they all have their limitations. Every sensor has its limitations. Radar cannot see underwater, only above the water. Your echo sounder is looking down, not ahead at what you're going to um, hopefully not hit. And electronic charts, many of them, the data is very old or mis um, mispositioned, or in many areas, it's changing so fast, especially in, the, in polar areas, that you're not going to have the details of very few soundings. So, um, so they all have their limitations. And they're all, all of these are missing an important piece of the navigation puzzle. They do not see underwater except for the depth sounder looking um, down, but they do not see what's in front of my yacht in real time at this point to make sure that I can safely go ahead. You want to make sure that, that um, you're not gonna have any surprises. So let's take a look, just a simple quick look at the differences between one, two, and 3D sonars. We're not, this is not a technical presentation. I don't want to put you to sleep. Uh, but so what is forward-looking sonar? Sonar itself um, uh, was originally used for depth sounding and looking down. But as you can see from this narrow beam um, going down from this yacht, that it's not going to tell you anything about the rock that you may hit. Luckily, this one's deep enough. You're not hitting it, but it tells you nothing about that. It may tell you the trends as you go along that you can get an idea of, of how the bottoms are changing, but it's not going to show you the obstacles. Okay. Now, what is forward-looking sonar? You can theoretically just take a depth sounder, which will give ping, 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 one point downward and face it forward. And that is a forward-looking sonar. You are taking a sonar, facing it forward. Uh, the first real forward-looking sonars were mainly fish-finding type ones where they will spin mechanically around 360 degrees, uh, similar to a radar, but they go through the water much slower than a radar, which um, can uh, repeat the under two seconds. And um, so therefore your yacht has already moved closer to that rock ahead of you if you have a mechanically spinning 1D sonar. The one dimension will gradually build up a two degree. Um, now, other uh, sonars, two dimensional sonars can take a slice, um, let's say a vertical slice, a very narrow beam, and go ping, 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 and give you a slice of what's ahead of you. But it might be to the left, or to the port, or to the starboard of this rock, and it's really not gonna help you avoid an accident. And then over time, a 2D could generate a 3D view. You know, you can take slices and build it up very similar to a medical uh, MRI picture. But again, you're moving as all this is happening. So it's, uh, it's not the best way to look at a navigation. Okay, so this um, picture is showing you the difference with the radar above the water, which is a very good tool because of the fast um, update rate on it. So, so it's very useful. So let's now take a look at what the difference with a 3D sonar would be. Um, you can see that, that wide uh, field representation of the sonar. The 3D sonars will look ahead out to a long range and will insonify. The sound goes out in all directions ahead of, uh, of the yacht and it puts sound into the whole area. And when it hits a bottom or if it hits a rock or a shipping container that will be in the water column, um, icebergs, the sound bounces back at all types of angles right back to the sonar to the receive elements. And so in that way, we can extract all that information 
at each at each ping, at each second of when it pings, we can get the whole volume of that um, of that uh, uh, almost like a cone. And an an um, allegory to that would be um, a depth sounder or a um, fish finder would have like a laser, a tiny pinpoint laser looking ahead. And if you were in a darkened room and you're trying to see what everything is, you'd be moving the laser all over the place trying to see it. Um, whereas a 3D forward looking sonar is more like a wide angle flashlight if you want to to compare from sound and, and light. Um, and uh, so that's the basic. There are many more metrics uh, on this. So to be an effective tool, you really want to have the fast update rate. Um, you want to be able to see the sea floor up to the sea surface. And um, you want to have a long enough range. And you want to do this all on one on each ping as you go along. So that's that's where the beginning of 3D forward looking sonars are. Okay. And this is a, another one more representation of the difference between 2D and 3D processing. Um, many of you may be familiar with um, more of a, a military sonar, the 2D, the high resolution, but looking Looking at the slide, the picture on the left-hand side, that's really a traditional 2D processing. You can see in the center there's a diagonal with a different color. These are the signal strengths, the different colors, and tells you the difference in sounds between materials. And, um, and you know something's there, but you have no idea if this is a safe area to go by. Can I pass over it? Is it something on the sea floor? Is it something in the water column? You don't have the depth, the third dimension in order to show you. You can go um, a higher and higher resolution and you might see more details, but you're not gonna see where that obstacle, potential obstacle is. On the right-hand side, this is the same data but with 3D processing. And this can allow that you can now see the depth, the range, the bearing, and the depth. And um, you can see that it pops right up out of the floor. And if you had the color scale, this is just, um, just showing the 3D processing, you can see just how deep can my vessel uh, make it over this area. You might have an alarm set up to tell you, you know, you want an extra meter, you want extra area, and will my alarm go off? Will I safely go through it? Okay, so, okay, so um, I'd like to talk about using the 3D sonar on on your yacht. What you're going to see operational wise, uh, what types of um, of screens can you call up, and what type of information. I'll also want to tell you what types of things it was designed to to find, um, you know, both stationary and um, and moving type of obstacles, and uh, then you'll get more of an idea of how to use it as we go toward the videos. Um, okay, so detecting obstacles, um, a practical. Uh, forward-looking sonar for navigation wants to see something that's large enough and detect it and warn you of something that's large enough to actually hurt your yacht or the people inside or um, any of the possessions. And so we are looking for rocks and reefs and we're looking for very shallow bottoms. Um, if you're going up in a fjord around Greenland, you might be in very deep water, but you're worried about a pinnacle that might pop up. So, um, so these are the types of obstacles that are stationary that we'd be looking at. When, when we bring someone out and first introduce them to a sonar, if they're not um, familiar with it, with our types of um, Argos systems, the we take them to look at bridge pilings this is almost a, the simplest representation because you have the bridge above the waterline 
and you have what you can't see by your eye under the water. So um, getting to see what the sonar looks like under and the bridge pilings under the water and how much wider they may be under the water. So that it's a good um, view for a beginner to, to see. And things that it won't see are, um, we we will filter out fish getting in the way. We try to filter out as many of the wave slaps um, because you you wouldn't want to wouldn't want to either have your alarm set to suddenly go go off on something with a small fish go in in front, or um, it, you know, so you want to make sure that that you have it set appropriately. And we also have uh, moving obstacles, such as the marine mammals. The, uh, it's very environmentally friendly. The lodge beaked whales, it's out of the herring zone of the lodge mammals. And a small dolphin will, will hit, will, might be attracted for a few minutes up to the sonar. It, it's not very loud to them. It's very quiet, almost like they're looking for a baby dolphin nearby. And some of them are curious and then they, they swim away. And icebergs and um, all types of post-disaster debris after tsunamis, after hurricanes. And uh, it can be very helpful because no matter what latest chart you may have, none of these items would be on, on a chart. This is one of the screens that, that you would see um, on an Argos, either 500, 1000, or Argos 350. This one goes out to 500 meters. We call this our 3D viewer. And what we're seeing is, the, um, is something in front of us. If we don't have a chart and we don't know the area, we don't know what it is. So we see in-water targets. And if you look on the bottom, that's the bathymetry of an area that we're going over. And I'll show you on um, another slide just um, why it's showing partially there and not out to the full 500 meters. That's another metric of bottom mapping uh, for that I will explain. And so the in-water targets, this, this one happens to be to the loudness, to the sounding. And you can see there's a white bar right at zero degrees uh, slice. You can, you can take a 2D slice um, of any bearing that you're going uh, to. When you're, you're going at speed, you're not gonna be using that um, 2D slice. But if you're going through some coral reefs or somewhere very slowly through a congested area, you might wanna see a little more detail at a certain bearing. So you can, uh, the operator can move that and you can see the profile at the bottom where like a depth sounder, you're seeing um, inform the data, the information of the bottoms and the, but we're looking ahead instead of a history of where you've been. So the similarity ends right there. And you can see far out um, uh, almost to the 500 meters, there's an obstacle and this display is showing it um, at the surface. That's because when you're out past the, the bottom uh, detection range, it will show you the information, but until you get closer, you're not gonna see the exact 3D details of it until you get uh, closer to the, the obstacle. So let's see what it looks like over a chart. And uh, this is the same data set over a chart. And you can see that uh, we show the, the um, 90 degree field of view. Yep, I don't know. And, uh, and we see the obstacle ahead. And that's like a, a busy uh, shoreline on the port side and directly ahead. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, piers and things happening. If you want to go down into the channel, you're going to have to look at that clear area and um, turn toward there. So it, it really is a safety area to see. Um, now you can see in this one, it's 90 degrees wide. Uh, if we actually go to 120 degree wide, uh, up, out to 200 meters, you can change the mode. 
And if you're going out to 1000 meters, it's a little bit narrower, 60 degree field of view, but you can see way out a thousand meters that way. So when you're coming close to shore to, um, or to an anchorage, you might want to look at more detail at a closer view. And now we see, oh, I can't hear. What? We have a question. Oh, you have a question. Fantastic. We have a Great. question. And Great. so the question is, where is the best place to position a, trans, a transducer or a forward looking sonar on a sailing yacht? Ah, OK. Um, well, you want it uh, to be the best operation. You would like it one meter below the water line. Um, so on, on sometimes it could be right embedded into the keel, into the bulb at the bottom of the keel, if you have that style, or it can be almost in um, a separate little pod right in front uh, of uh, of your keel. You want it as low down, as far forward, but without interfering uh, uh, with, with any other um, uh, electronics or something right on, on the hull. Um, yeah, so um, so most of them we've seen are usually right forward of the the keel, um, though we, we also can be in the keel. And if you'd like, I can send you. Um, I don't have uh, any uh, uh, visual of the installation process for this presentation, but I would be happy if you contact me and to send you uh, lots of different um, installations on sailing yachts. Yeah, I, I'm a sailor, so it's very important to me. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, all right, so this one is overlaid on a chart. So you can see the field of view and you can see how, um, how valuable it is to be able to see was in this particular area, is my chart correct or is it off? Should I adjust to uh, my historical chart and make sure that there's nothing new or that it's not, you know, a few meters off from what I thought it was? So, so uh, I, I feel to me that's one of the important um, views to look at. And I would put that in the center of my user interface, which I will show you next. Okay. All right. Oh, no. Can you turn on the video? Of, yeah, this. I'm on it. Um, uh, your wish is my command. Okay, thank you. Okay, here is is a video of um, this same uh, data set. We decided it would be easiest to, to um, continue with this representation. You can see the 3D view, which you know is more like a video view. You can. You saw that the display was able to move that um, so you can change it. It could almost be like a flyby or um, whichever way uh, you the navigator wants to see it. Oh, oh, oh OK. That, um, all right, I can show the rest from the stationary. I didn't know it was short. As you can see here, we're coming up on a very shallow pier on the, the um, starboard side. So you can see that we're in very shallow water. When you're in a shallow situation, the uh, you don't you can't um, display and detect the bottom all the way out to the full 500 meters or 1,000 meters. Uh, there's a besides maximum range. There is another metric where. Uh, depends how much water is below your transducer module. Um, it's the uh, it's a limitation of physics. Uh, we always uh, we can do eight times at the minimum. Sometimes it even goes higher times the depth of water. So if you're in a hundred meters, you could see way out to, and, and map the bottoms out to 800 meters or more. But when you get near shore in the shallow areas, um, with the incident of the the acoustics hitting the bottoms, um, some of that energy goes away instead of uh, uh, back to the sensor. Um, but, um, but another view, I, well, I'll show you on the next slide. What I want to show here is also the, the color scale on the bottom right-hand side. Uh, here, 
the color is mapped to the depth. So this to me is a very practical way to be able to see if something is deep or shallow as you're traveling along because um, the sh shallow will be toward the yellow and the deeper safer areas are blue. And for the default, we use this for the bottoms, we use this scale. And you can always change it back to how loud or soft um, the sonar soundings are too. And on the top scale, it's by the decibels, the soundings and the hardness. And you can do, you can switch back and forth also for the in-water targets that way too. So, uh, you know, we, we try to make it that everyone, Far Sounder makes it that everyone can choose their own display, their own, um, uh, favorite uh, views that they wish to see. You see on the top, we have the NMEA data coming in. Now that can also be closed off. If you need a conning for a smaller yacht, you might want to just have everything right here on the main display, or you can hide it. You can take this chart overlay and put that into the main center area, which as I said, um, that's uh, one that I, I prefer. And, um, we have a lot, lots of other views too. Okay, so look. Oh. Another question. Great, great. Yeah, I'm so, so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, no, this is my pleasure to have it a two-way conversation. It's great. Great. There's also um, back, back to the positioning of the transducer. It's like, can it also be installed in the hoist or like a bow thruster? Oh, absolutely. Yes, we. Um, yes, we are. The far sounder systems have been installed with hoists. Um, uh, uh, so far, currently, they have been for the, the Argos 500 and the Argos 1000, and are um, basically mainly on some uh, ice, not just ice class, but ice breakers seem to prefer that method because when they're going into two year ice, something very hard and they're really going in to break it apart, they will pull the sonar up in, into the hull and then put it down. So even like the Sir David Attenborough in the UK, where on that they have a very sophisticated hoist. And uh, we also have them on yachts. Some of them are just our ice class, but not ice breakers that they're traveling the Northwest Passage and they just, the, the family made the decision, they're more comfortable that they wanna bring it up in case they get into the um, heavy ice. But um, yeah, yet yeah, it's such a great detector of ice that um, uh, unless you really needed it, if you're going in older ice, I, I, you know, you want, you really want to keep it, it out. Um, and um, now we have the, um, our Argos 350 sonar, which we've had so many requests that people are going to uh, want it for, um, on a hoist for different reasons, small survey vessels, smaller vessels that are going at speed. So they might uh, bring it up into the, the hull as they um, go fast on a planing hole and then they bring it down uh, later on. So, so we actually designed the new one where the connection can be on the top of the sonar transducer or it could be on the rear. And now we've already had orders so they will be um, on some hoists very shortly and we'll be able to show you pictures of our, our new system with a hoist or through the hull. Um, so yes, um, there, uh, there are those opportunities for that. Thank you. So now I'd like to talk about the local history mapping. It's another capability that, that we have added to our systems. Uh, it, the systems are designed, the forward-looking sonar for real-time navigation. Originally, you, um, you really care what's in front of me at any time. How do I avoid an accident? That's the main function. However, we've been collecting data for, for, for years and we have everything we've recorded into a database. Um, and uh, we've realized we get questions all the time. Well, couldn't I have where I've been? And that, so we came out with our local history mapping maybe a few years ago where um, it, it, the products around it are still um, being worked out because everybody wants something different. 
but um, but I will be showing you soon how to do how to use the local history mapping to help you in your travels and to off the beaten path. So you'll see a video on that soon. So you can see on both of uh, both of these screenshots that the data of the bottoms in great detail can be uh, can be saved and then you can come back in the area and know where you've been. Currently with, with the systems, it's about an hour's worth of, uh, of data, but we'll, we'll, I'll talk to where that's going later. So, um, so this is very, very important. Yes, the charts are there and they have a much higher resolution, but this is real 3D, um, real information of what the situation, you go to a tsunami area, a chart's not gonna help you. What what does the bottom, the bottoms change after hurricanes, the bottoms change um, because of ice all, all over. So um, so it it's used in, uh, in conjunction with the real time, which you're looking forward, but then you can go and, and have the history of, of where you are. And the charts within our platform can be either S57, S63 charts. Uh, they can be CMAP charts. Uh, you can also, uh, through our SDK, data can be outputted into a third party interface. It could be an ECDIS, it could be ECN, it could be a survey package, um, all, all sorts of things like that too. So, um, whoops, did I, did I? Nope, that was it. It just did it. Okay, so talking about the local history mapping and the data, we have so much data. So now what are we going to do with all, all this data? As I mentioned, we've been collecting it for years. We now have all our data up in the cloud and uh, we've been building a the infrastructure to collect uh, data from customers, to be able to use that as we go forward with um, a, a lots of different applications and customer needs. So, so we have a, we currently, since January, 2019, we started a customer expedition data collection program. And we have many partners in the yachting community and also several cruise ships who are going to the most exotic areas uh, globally. And then they, uh, we give them a hard disk and they send it back to us. And then my, um, my, my team of R&D um, engineers just go wild with it and we put it into our database for use. And so uh, we, we currently have about 11 ships and I think a few more are coming on now who are part of this program and um and here are some of the data that we've collected around the world um just since uh, already since we started the program we have over 30 terabytes of data so these are not single points that you see each of the circles represents many multiple pings in that area and you can see we actually had someone starting on the the east coast in boston i think that's the purple line and they went down through the canal the the west coast of south america and down to antarctica and over to the atlantic side and you can see on the upper left hand uh we've had uh the vessels going through the northwest passage We've had other people in um, in the Asia and Australia all, and as you can see, a lot around the Mediterranean and the North Shore of Europe, so um, the North Sea. So this was just um, an exciting way to to show you just the beginnings of what can be done with the data collection. Yeah, and um, oh no, here's a, a another short little video, I think it repeats itself, I'm not sure. If you can turn it on, great. Uh, this, is, this is some of the data right in Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, um, near Newport, where we do, as I said, we do much of our experimentation um, in that area because of the varying depths. And, and then we overlaid a transparent chart. Um, so you can see how well it's following it. And, 
Obviously in Narragansett Bay, things are well charted, so you might not need it, but imagine going to somewhere in the world where the, there weren't any good charts if any, and they might be just a few pings, um, the, you know, a few soundings. So having all this information and building your own chart and seeing where you are is, uh, can be very useful. So um, uh, thank, thank you, Ono. Mm -hmm. can, I think we can go back to that. Perfect, perfect, thank you. Ah, okay. So, um, so that's what do we do with all this data? This is some of what we can do, and um, we we also are working with um, with the IHO and with NOAA. We're a trusted. Uh, our sound is a trusted node for for NOAA, the first three D sonar, to be able to give. Uh, data to their crowdsource bathymetry database. So we're, we're very excited about that. We don't share our customers' data unless they give us permission with that. Um, uh, some of them, we could just use it for internal to improving our software and features for the future. But um, for, for those who are willing to share some of the data anonymously, to uh, NOAA and um, so we're involved, the Far Sound team is involved on the IHO and NOAA um, working group for crowdsource bathymetry. So um, what we see for the yachts is if your boss has a fleet of, of yachts, we can see that um, someday all that data that is collected from all the, the fleet uh, can be shared among each other. So. Um, similar to some cruise ships in the future, once they get back uh, working, they're interested in that also. So th there's, there's many opportunities to in, increase and go along with this forward looking sonar. So now we're gonna have a, a poll. Um, and, oh, you have a question? No, I'm oh. ready for the poll. Oh. I'm always like, uh, hey, so we're having a poll and that means I wake up. <laughs> ah, oh, okay. Okay. So uh, we're, we're curious, not just where you are going, but where are some of the most challenging places that you have been over the last few years on your yacht? Or, or what's, uh, you, if you have an upcoming trip, uh, what types of environments does your vessel um, uh, like to go to? So, okay. um, so I think, yeah. what? I'm publishing the poll, and uh, so there's a few answers there. The tropics, Arctic or, or Antarctic, fjords, river and inland waterways, all of the above, or more than two of the above, just to see where everybody oh. is. So if you guys uh, would just like to um, uh, start answering the question, here we go, it starts moving quickly. Ah. You see uh, a lot of uh, tropics, Arctic, Antarctic, fjords, more than two of the above that are people that are traveling a lot. Uh, obviously, yep. uh, let's see if we can get some more answers in there. Ah, fantastic. So hardly anybody to rivers and in, inland waterways. I, I find that, that's interesting, right? Yes, yes. Well, we, if you expand that to uh, canals to get from places, yeah, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe, know. maybe, yes. Yeah, so it's very know. equally divided, to be honest. Oh, uh, oh okay, we've got, we've got some tropics coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, then we got someone saying, Steve saying the Red Sea coast of Saudi Arabia, uncharted reefs is, uh, yeah. is yeah. like, uh, uh, I know Steve is, uh, you've been based over there, right, Steve? Or you spent quite some time there. Uh? Oh. So uh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, good, good, great. Then um, let me. Let me, uh, so let me yeah. end the poll and give it back to you, Cheryl. Oh, okay, hmm. fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna talk about several of these areas. Um, the polar regions and fjords are put as one. When you're traveling there, you're worried um, about the 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 bergies, the large icebergs, and in the fjords, especially the pinnacles that I mentioned earlier, those are of great concern. And the another thing is the the charts in polar regions are not as useful as some, such as in the um, Narragansett Bay. So 
you can't depend on having the correct information. Plus things change so much that you, you really, a, a forward looking sonar, seeing the, the small icebergs coming at you and being able to see and weave your way through. Don't forget they're much larger underwater than above water. So rather than just guessing at how large and wide they are, you would use the sonar to see those. And, um, and then in um, even when you're trying to go around Greenland and you're trying to anchor, uh, there can be, you might be in a deep area and then with the tides changing or you're swinging around to a very shallow area, I'm gonna show you a video soon that will we'll cover that. Um, okay. And here, all right, this uh, rivers and narrow waterways is, um, yeah, also the Cor Corinth Canal, I thought would be a, a more most exciting one to see here. So um, uh, yeah, obviously you're gonna go slowly through it, but um, you know, a lot of the the rivers, the uh, there's so much more um, changes in rivers. If you're an inland waterway, it doesn't sound like you, many of you are, but the rivers are gonna change drastically. Even if they're muddy, they're still, because of the um, the tides and stuff, it's it, it's not gonna be as helpful to have the inland waterway charts. Um, okay. And um, tropical coves, which I'm curious to know if this is the, the largest group of the pole later, maybe Ono will, will tell us. And um, so I, we hear from many of our yachting customers about going into a tropical cove and the boss wants you to go off into a little inlet somewhere that you've never been, that you don't know how shallow it's gonna get, there are little reefs around there. And so this is a perfect example of when you want first the forward looking sonar in real time, but also you have the uh, the local history mapping of as you're going into it, what the area looks like. So that later after lunch, you're pulling anchor, you want to get out, um, you know, how do I most safely get through there? And um, talking about anchoring, I have another video that can show you this last video. Oh no. If you can turn it on, the anchor survey. And this is useful for the tropical areas where you're going into an inlet and it should start moving in a second. Um, a lot of kids around the world still going to school slow in the internet. There it is, okay. So here on the right, you can see uh, this yacht is making a, um, a an anchor survey so they can find and decide the best place to go uh, for an anchor survey. So, um, and again, that could be useful in Greenland when there's such a drastic change in depth over there too, and man, many areas around the world. So this is just different ways to help you move safely um, on your global. Thank you. Okay, so the last section, is about avoiding accidents and what things have caused some accidents in the past. Um, obviously, they didn't have a 3D forward looking sonar here. Um, some of you may be familiar with this picture of this cruise ship, the Explorer. Many years ago, the Explorer was actually the first cruise ship to go down to Antarctica. Can you imagine being on that first trip? And um, and then years later, in 2007, it was also the first cruise ship to sink completely. It has never been retrieved in there. And thankfully, no one was killed. All the passengers were rescued by nearby ships. Well, they weren't right there, but they did come, come over quickly and got them out. And um, But can you imagine if you were more off the beaten track and you had an accident and could not, not get to safety. Um, they're pretty sure that it was um, a large pack of ice, um, Bergy, that had a whole bunch of rocks in it. They're thinking is um, is that what is happened to that vessel? And very expensive and more to the and also traumatizing to the people who were there. Um, okay. And here's one, a military vessel. Um, 
Uh, I picked this one more because it, uh, it ran aground on a reef in the Philippines. And this was one instance where the chart was completely off. It had the reef eight miles away. So, you know, how old was that data? You know, when when did somebody make the chart? How off was it? So um, this, this, besides being embarrassing, because the Navy, it, the salvage cost was expensive. They had to, they never used it. They had to pull apart the, the vessel. And then on top of that, their environmental penalties, which um, um, makes a lot of sense because they ruined some of the reef. So, um, so here is one, this was a mine countermeasures, but they couldn't see ahead of them. Um, okay, I'll just do a couple more. Um, uh, the Fenica is another one that um, that they thought completely, they went by the charts, they thought they were completely safe. They even waited for the higher tides. They thought they had several meters of, of room and they hit a rocky shoal. And it, at that point, it was not, it was uncharted. It was not on the chart at all. Now it's been added to it, but um, this is an accident that could have also been avoided. They would have seen the shallow areas. They would have seen the rocks, for, you know, um, in there it would have been a good target. So um, it's a Fenica. And um, I'm just doing um, one yacht. Um, uh, but this one is, um, it was not the owner or the captain's fault. What happened, it was actually just coming out of its yard, the shipyard, going on sea trials for the engines. And here is one place, they had a sonar, they didn't turn it on. They figured, they, oh, we'll, we'll turn the sonar, we'll test that on another day. Obviously the engines are very important, they would just test the engines that day. Well. It's an interesting business model because they did crash. They had they ruined the sonar. We get to sell them a second sonar, but it's not a business model that that I would enjoy um, increasing. And this was their own home port. So when they did go back out, when everything was repaired and they went back out, um, one of our team went on board with them to see just what, what happened and to make sure nothing happened going along. As you can see on the right hand side, you can see the new breakwater. That's the um, thing. The old breakwater was still under it. They threw the rocks on top and naturally the rocks started coming forward and they were in positions um, from the old breakwater that had never happened before because of the new breakwater. So, so it can be very deceptive what you see above the water can be very different from what's under the water or what you saw last week. Oh, you know, I know this area, I don't need any sonar. That can change in a very short while. So, um, so that's the last example of accidents. But um, I just wanted to talk about the risk management perspective of having a sonar on your vessel. Um, you know, accidents can be costly, even if if it's only in time and not money. If you have to haul something out, ha have it fixed, have it surveyed um, afterwards when it's repaired, you, you don't get the luxury of having your yacht. If you're a charter yacht, you, um, you've lost charter time. And, um, and then your insurance, you wanna minimize the claims. Um, so, um, uh, so there's there's so many expenses. So you really the, um, want to be very careful and do whatever you can. And even for the crew and the um, the captain's job security, you have a great great job going around the world. You want to make sure that um, there are no accidents and that no one specifically is hurt, especially even more than the vessel itself. So um, so risk management is something. And it's not like you go to auto for automobiles, you have this that you get 5% off or anything, but you can use it when you're negotiating insurance, um, you know, letting them know you have a, um, a three default with looking sonar would be helpful. Okay, so forward looking sonar is not yet required in by IMO by any Coast Guard that we know of and not required yet of their insurance companies. 
Yeah, they're used throughout the world, the Arctic, Antarctic, all types of vessels from um, yachts to cruise ships, to survey vessels, to military vessels, to, to all, all sorts of ones. So I thought this would be an introduction of how to go off the beaten path more safely. So if anyone has any questions, um, I'd love to answer them. Do we have time to? We definitely have time, and I think that like we had a great presentation. There's a few questions out, out there, and uh, very interesting. Uh, you first asked me a question like, "What's like the most the region that was selected most?" Remember where they went? That was tropics. Yeah. A few thoughts, and then we had Steve who said like, uh, who was talking about the Red Sea coast of Saudi Arabia, and he was yeah. there for 22 years, and then he says later he's now using a Furuno CH24. And his last question is, what are the costs involved? So I think I might have you lead. Huh? So if you're thinking about what's the capital and, and you're running the maintenance, are there any consumables? Yeah. Is there anything you want to say on that? Or is there yeah. something you would prefer yeah. to discuss in private with Steve? Yeah, um, well, I, I think there should be some transparency when there isn't a lot in this industry. So the range of sonars, the base, the, the base prices are range from like 50, this is all in US dollars, 55,000 US for our smaller one. This, and this is 2020. So if this internet stays on, obviously the prices will change. Um, so they start at 55,000. The um, next one is a little over 100,000 for the 500 meter range Argos 500. And for the Argos 1000, like 176. Obviously you're gonna have shipyard costs. You're gonna have the, the fairing designed or if someone has a hoist um, to have that designed into the ship. Uh, shipping costs, commissioning, and there might be, you might want to have it integrated into a more sophisticated way into some, um, some IBS. So, um, but the, you know, um, that's where, that's where they start. And, um, um, we're very excited that we brought out our new one that, which is goes down to, it can fit on a 20 meter, 18 meter, 20 meter, uh, yacht. And we're very excited. Um, uh, about ha now having that alternative too. Good. Well, thank you for that answer. Alex is obviously also worried about the ecosystem and says, would it be able to detect something as shallow as Neptune grass meadows or anything? The, 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 for, for I, the for it itself. wouldn't identify it. It would, um, the soundings would be very sound. So it would be a soft, if you, you would, that's the instance where you would want to use the, um, the signal strength rather than depth of the water. So you turn it to the signal strength and um, and you can hear the different sounding. So it might be more like a muddy bottom, but um, um, that's an interesting one. There may be a way to adapt it um, uh, uh, for seeing more. We are, uh, for the resolution, uh, we'll have to check that out. I would love to talk to Alex ahead of time or, or afterwards and and have him discuss that with my team. Um, yeah. They love new ideas of detecting new things. Great. Um, well, uh, Steve, thank you for your transparency. Much appreciated. That's kind of, um, we got a, another question is if the new August 350 could be installed in a large tender I know I, I missed the last half of that on the Argo. The, new, the Argos 350 you were talking about pre earlier, could it be installed on a, on a large tender, for example? Would that work as well? Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. What, yeah. Would, what would be the benefit of having it on a tender? Because it has less draft. Uh, I, there's, if you're bringing people to shore from an area, mm and you have the family on board and you wanna bring them up to shore, you wanna make sure or over to some secluded beach, maybe the mothership is is still anchored out there and you wanna you want to make sure that you're not gonna get stuck on rocks on or ruin some reefs. Um, okay. So that another area, someone at a marina had asked uh, if we put it on a small boat, can, then we can go and do some, um, some real time chart that local history mapping and mm -hmm. keep the data and see if the bottoms have changed. And when some mm -hmm. of their large yachts come in, they used to fit into the slip and maybe something has changed post hurricanes and just um, 
over time with things changing. So, so if you want to get um, the, the survey done too, uh, some marinas were interested in keeping it on their small vessels there. So. Okay, it'll make sense. Well, yeah, it's, uh, also, um, it's also going to be a, a good one for autonomous and smart shipping. So we're involved in a project now that's starting. So um, because they, they usually go slower. Also, they might only need the 350 meter, but with autonomous vessels in the future or remote operated, um, the Argos 350 is really good for that too. Will be. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I mean, perfect. It's 55 minutes in. We've had, we, had, we did our questions. You did an amazing presentation. Um, very knowledgeable. So uh, compliments from our side. It's made, you've made my life very easy. Great. So, uh, so yeah. thank you so much. Um, guys, if there are no more questions, um, the only thing I can say is thank you so much for attending. Uh, again, we'll be, um, we I have recorded, so we'll put it live. So for everybody to look back, I know uh, some pe a few people uh, came in a bit later, I saw in my dashboard. So if you missed the beginning, make sure that you have a look back because that's where Shell gave the introductory explanation. And uh, Jacqueline is saying, can we have your email address, please? Is that something yes. that you'd mind typing into the chat, Cheryl? Or you want me oh, to sure. do that? Uh, we yeah. have his chat. I'd be happy to. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Okay, here we go. So that's coming out there for everybody to use. Uh, don't spam her. Uh, I believe she's married, so I don't think, and no inappropriate messages, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but normally I would love to meet you everywhere in the world. We, we travel, we go to shows, and hopefully we'll eventually be able to go back to doing that. In addition to this, I loved having the webinar opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And we'll be back tomorrow morning, uh, European time. Uh, and then we're gonna look at how easy it is to hack your yachts. And, mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, I have to tell you, it is quite easy. Mm -hmm. And so, and the human factor is a big, big thing in that. So we'll be discussing a lot about that tomorrow morning. We've got a, a guest speaker who is actually a hacker. So he's going to tell us all about what, uh, how he, I believe it's a he, how he did it in the, in, in the past. But for now, thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you everybody for thank attending. You. Have thank a wonderful uh, day in the US. Have a wonderful evening in Europe. And, um, Everybody, bye-bye. Thank you, Cheryl. Bye. Bye. bye.